We're all set, Nick. Hey, Tony, how are you? Very well, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I just want to welcome everyone to the second uh, annual Chicago Sports Symposium. It's uh, really great to be able to expand the course, and I think you talked about that earlier. I just want to thank our team here at Gold Coast Surgery Center. They've been very accommodating with the uh, live surgical demos. It really takes a team approach to set this up and make it successful. So we'd like to thank all of those uh, involved. I have with me here in the room uh, Rachel Frank, who's one of our new fellows who trained at Rush. Katie Gross is my PA. Brendan Sweeney is my second PA. Uh, Heather Scalise is our anesthesiologist. And we have uh, Rachel and Wu helping us on the nursing side. So we're going to do an arthroscopic rotator cuff r repair for you. Can you guys go to the PowerPoint, please? So this patient is a 62-year-old female. She's had a history of right shoulder rotator cuff repair two years ago, but is now having progressive left atraumatic shoulder pain. She has night pain, activity-related lateral shoulder pain. She's undergone some therapy and a cortisone injection. She's got preserved active range of motion, but with pain. She did have pain over her biceps with no pain over the AC joint. She has uh, good uh, strength, although weakness, pain-related in both elevation and rotation, and her belly press test is equivocal. You can see the standard radiographic series that we get, including an AP, a Y, or an outlet view, and an axillary view. Uh, pretty well-maintained joint space, but uh, a type 2 to early type 3 acromion. And on her MRI scan, uh, you can clearly see involvement of the supraspinatus. Unfortunately, this scan was done in slight internal rotation, which makes evaluation of the subscapularis a little bit difficult. Uh, we're going to look at that intraoperatively, and her muscle is well maintained. We started this uh, case a little bit earlier. Our plan is an arthroscopy to evaluate the biceps and release it in preparation for a tenodesis. We're going to evaluate the subscapularis, a subchromial bursectomy and decompression, a cuff repair, and then a subpectoral tenodesis. This is what her biceps looked like uh, when we started, so this correlates with our clinical finding. You can see significant fraying and partial tearing, and so the biceps was released, and we'll take you into the shoulder joint uh, at this point. Is there any questions from the audience? I just have to turn down the volume in the room. <clears throat> okay, so we're in the subacromial space here. You can clearly see that she has a, a superior rotator cuff tear involving the supraspinatus with some involvement of the infraspinatus. You can see that uh, the glenohumeral joint is very well maintained, her articular cartilage is maintained on both the humeral and the glenoid side. And here you see the subscapularis, which actually turned out to be fairly normal in appearance. We've already released the biceps, as I said. We did a light debridement of the stump, as well as of the uh, labrum itself. And now we're up on top, uh, preparing for our rotator cuff repair. One of the things that uh, we talk about frequently, Tony, is to evaluate the, the identity of the tear itself. And in most cases, we'll find that we either have a small crescenteric tear, but as these tears get larger, as you know, uh, they often form either an L or a reverse L-type tear. In this situation, you can see that she's evolving a split between the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. There's some fairly significant degeneration of the tissue here. This is the uh, leading edge of the supraspinatus, and, excuse me, infraspinatus, and here's the supraspinatus. And so this is really an evolving reverse L-type tear, and we're going to need to pull this tear not just straight laterally, but we're going to pull the supraspinatus in a lateral and slight posterior direction in order to achieve the anatomic reduction. Again, you can see the inferior quality of the tissue here. It looks relatively degenerative and poor vascularity, and this is really where we're hoping that in the next uh, few years we'll begin to see some biologics evolve that will help us to deal with this devascularization issue. Uh, they need to turn it up a little bit so I can hear them if you ask questions. Can you put the bone cutter on for me, please? Nick, you can hear me fine, right? Nick, can you hear me? Uh, Tony, I'm sorry, we had the volume down a little bit. So we're going to start just by doing a limited acromioplasty. We've already started this, but we'll just show you how we're going to finish this. We're basically using a cutting block te technique. I'm looking from the side to evaluate where the acromion is really flat, and then taking all of the remaining bone to coplane the acromion to make it flat from front to back. The key here is also to remember that 
the lateral downslope or the critical angle laterally has been associated with increased risk of rotator cuff issues. And so I'm very careful to dissect the entire lateral border of the acromion to make sure that I can see that so that I know that I've done a complete acromioplasty to the lateral side and I'm not leaving any lateral downslope. So now we'll look at the tuberosity here. Again, we've already identified our cuff tear. You can see that we've got the edge of the articular surface. And so I'm going to really do a fairly wide decortication here just to create a bleeding bed for healing. We know that the uh, blood supply to the rotator cuff healing zone comes from the bone into the tendon. And so I really want to spend some time here making sure that I'm doing just a light decortication, creating this nice yellow bleeding bone. Obviously, I don't want to take away too much bone where I may destabilize my ability to get cortical fixation of my anchors, but I certainly want to create a bleeding rim. And in fact, we will use um, a microfracture type device to uh, account further accomplish that. So the first thing I'm going to do is target my lateral portal, which will allow me to put in my anchors. Can I get a spinal needle, please? And then we're going to take the punch next. So we're going to come just off the edge of the acromion to see what that looks like in terms of placing our anchors. And I think we're going to be right in this zone. And this will allow me to place one anchor anteriorly, one anchor posteriorly. And then my plan would probably be to use a cinch stitch in the back to try to deal with, which likely will end up with a small dog ear. So I'm going to just make a stab wound for percutaneous placement. <clears throat> Let's get a mallet, please. We're going to come just off the edge of the articular surface for our medial anchors. We'll prepare our pilot hole posteriorly. Keep that in your hand, please. And then we're going to prepare our pilot hole anteriorly, just slightly externally rotate the arm at the elbow. Good. Nick, can you hear us? I got you, yes. OK. So this is a 62-year-old lady. What if it was a 75-year-old lady? Do you have to do something different if the bone's osteoporotic? Well, there are a couple things that we can do. Number one is we can upsize our anchors, so we can prepare the same size pilot hole, but use a 5.5 or even a 6.5 anchor. In my experience, that's been sufficient in order to gain uh, appropriate fixation. We obviously have taps that we use for harder bone if you need to accomplish that. Uh, in worst case scenario type situations, you can actually use a screw uh, similar to a biceps tenodesis screw and put suture or tape through that so that you get a nice uh, firm bite into a small hole, and then use that as your medial row. Uh, but fortunately, with contemporary anchor techniques, it's uh, fairly uncommon that we actually see failure at the anchor site versus failure at the suture tendon interface site. So in this case, we're using, uh, this is a 5.5 millimeter helicoil anchor. You can see that it's got this open architecture platform that means that the center of the anchor is hollow to allow some egress of marrow elements. And in this case, the uh, anchor's loaded with a tape and a suture. What we're going to do is unload one of the sutures and load it up free to use as our cinch stitch. So I'm going to hand that off to Wu. And uh, Wu, I'll take probably a uh, crescent mm -hmm. spectrum in the back. Not yet. So I'm going to come in here, and right at the corner of my tear, I'm going to put in this. Can you grab that for me, Rachel? This hopefully at the end will help me to deal with the lateral margin and the dog ear portion of the tear. Go ahead and retrieve that in front of the tapes, please. Other side. Good. All right, so we're going to pass a loop through here. And I'll take a loop retriever next. Okay, so um, Rachel, if you can just pull the loop back until I can see it in the joint, then I'm going to retrieve my other sutures. Yep, keep going. So Nick, there's uh, lots of different ways to pass these sutures. Uh, this is your favorite way of doing it? I, I like to do this because my preference is to look from laterally. I think that helps me to uh, appreciate the configuration of the tear and, like I said, to identify the anatomy of the tear in terms of whether it goes uh, from a front to back or back to front portion. Certainly, I could use a direct suture passing device from here, from my lateral portal, um, to, to pass as well. 
but I find that the, uh, the Spectrum or an AccuPass device is the most low profile and allows me to really choose my point of entry and to penetrate the tissue exactly where I want while looking from a lateral portal. So the next step is we're going to pass our tapes, so just make sure you don't unload that, please. Mm -hmm. And we use an uh, AccuPass device to the left to begin placing some mattress sutures through the rotator cuff. Um, Rachel's going to help me by just using an espresso, excuse me, using a um, grasping type device to be able to reduce the tendon into an anatomic position, and that way I can choose my position for actually putting these tapes through. So we're going to come back to the back of the tear. Tony, here you can see the musculotendinous junction. So here's muscle, here's tendon. As you know, one of the difficulties with this technique is the potential for uh, type 2 failures, which means that the failure occurs between the muscle and the tendon. And that can be a very difficult problem to deal with simply because you don't have much tendon to, to work with. So you can see that I've come just off the edge of the articular surface by about four to five millimeters, which means that I'm gonna come into the tendinous portion of the rotator cuff rather than into the muscle portion or the muscular, uh, the muscular um, muscular tendinous junction. So we're gonna take this out, make sure that we've got our right uh, tape so we're not unloading here. So, so Nick, um, just yeah, if this that. was a larger tear, if it involved all of the infraspinatus, do you have to change anything in your setup, or this setup works for all types of tears? In terms of just the patient positioning, or what are you referring to? Well, I know you do them all in the beach chair position, but do you have to adjust your portals, or do you, is this approach that you're using basically the one that you use for all types of rotator cuff repair surgery? Yeah, I, grab the back one, please. I, I do use this setup in terms of the actual patient positioning and the setup that we have here, the portal positioning. Uh, a couple things that I may do differently is for subscapularis involvement, we'll add an anterior lateral portal that allows me to work into the lesser tuberosity, lesser tuberosity acupass back. And then if, if this tear had extended into the infraspinatus, what I would typically do is put a, a posterior lateral anchor somewhere back in this position put simple sutures through the infraspinatus uh, to reapproximate the normal infraspinatus supraspinatus junction and then come back and do a double row repair for the supraspinatus similar to what you're seeing here. So most of the adjustments that we make are really on the configuration of our repair more so than on the technique our, itself. The technique stays relatively consistent. So right okay, now you're going to pass uh, the, another ahead. tape through? Yeah, we're going to do a mattress configuration. This could be done actually through a single pass. My preference is to spread them out just to provide some compression on the medial aspect. But certainly you can do this passing both uh, sutures through, a, or both tapes in this situation, through a single pass in the tendon. It's really dealer's choice. And then, of course, you can just... Go ahead. Next anchor. You can, you can decide at that point whether you prefer to tie medially or simply do a knotless type repair. And I think we're going to talk about that during the meeting. Uh, fortunately, with the tape constructs and the improvement in our lateral row constructs, uh, we've gone to, in many situations, a knotless configuration. So here you can see the second anchor. This is, a, a, again, a helicoil anchor. You can appreciate the open architecture structure, which uh, hopefully will help us a little bit with our biology. Amazingly, even though this structure looks fairly flimsy in comparison to traditional anchors, it actually has better pull-out strength than most, most uh, solid bore anchors. So let's get one of those out of the lateral portal. Can I get the AccuPass back, please? Uh, Would now be a good time to check on Dr. Cole and see Sure, we're just going to repeat these steps. So we're going to go back and pass uh, these two into um, in another mattress configuration similar to what you just saw. And then we'll hold on you coming back to put our lateral row anchors in. Great. All right, got Nick, it? why don't you reorient us again so we know because you've got like a, a, a tape spaghetti view for us here. <laughs> So what we've done at this point is to pass our additional anterior two tapes in a mattress configuration. So I have two tapes posteriorly, two tapes anteriorly, and then I brought out one of my uh, anterior tapes and one of my posterior tapes through the lateral portal along with the cinch stitch. And these will all eventually end up into our lateral row uh, fixation. And so you can see here that we've started to prepare lateral row fixation. We've come about 10 millimeters off the edge of the uh, tuberosity in line with the anterior and posterior aspect of the tear, as well as our um, medial row anchors. The first thing that I'm going to do, Tony, is I'm going to use this uh, uh, device that's called a nanofracture. Uh, it's a device that we use to perform a gentle microfracture within the uh, area of the repair. So this just makes some very small holes into the tuberosity, again, with the idea here, in, here that we can facilitate some bleeding 
into the rotator cuff repair site. How small site. are those holes? Uh, these are uh, about 1.7 millimeter holes, so they're really pretty tiny. And they go pretty deep, don't they? They do. They go about, here's the depth you can see, they're probably about three to four millimeters. And once we're done, we can even do this on the lateral aspect of the tuberosity to facilitate as well. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the arm into abduction. This will just allow me access to the um, lateral aspect of the tuberosity. As I said, we've already loaded these sutures into an anchor, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my assistant come in through this anterior portal and just help us to reduce the rotator cuff into a more anatomic position. So we're going to grip the edge of the tendon, if I can get it here, and we're just going to pull it over where we want it, trying to reduce it anatomically. Do you guys have the outside shot there? Yeah, we can see both. Okay, so we've got these uh, sutures loaded into what's called a footprint anchor. It's a lateral row anchor that allows for uh, fixation and independent tensioning of the sutures. I'm going to have my assistant hold the camera for me. We're going to hold the arm into slight internal rotation to be able to access the back. And we're going to slide this down into the joint. Here's our previously prepared pilot hole. Go ahead and insert that for me, Rachel. So that gets docked. We have a stay stitch on the anchor that needs to get removed, and this is used just simply if you were to ever lose control of the anchor in the subacromial space, this would allow you to maintain that. And then what I'm going to do is just to tension each of these sutures and tapes to be able to gain my reduction. So take that for me, please. So we're going to do this uh, independently as best as we can. So, so some systems you have to do that ahead of time, but with this one, it allows you to tension it after your anchor is seated. This one allows you to further tension after the anchor is seated. So I pull on these each independently. You're right, and some systems obviously you have to know the system that you're working with. You may need to t pre-tension as you're inserting the anchor. In this particular tension uh, system, I'm able to do that afterwards. So once I get the tension that I'm happy with, uh, then there's a little knob on the insertion handle that you simply turn, and that locks the suture and tape into the anchor so that there can be no back slippage once the insertion handle is removed. So once we get those out, can I get an open cutter, please? We're going to take this straight out, and that's our first lateral row anchor. We're going to cut these, and then we'll move on to our second. Nick, to someone who hasn't seen this before, this looks very complicated with lots of sutures. How do you keep it all organized? So I think there's a couple key points here. Number one is visualization is critical in this situation. And uh, fortunately, our anesthesiologist, Heather, has done an excellent job. Our blood pressure right now is about 100 over uh, 60, which means that we've got excellent control of visualization within the uh, space. The other things that we've done is we, we're using a pump with a pressure of approximately 50. Currently, I'll actually run that pressure up to 60, occasionally 70 if I need to, but I try to prevent that. Um, and then lastly, we put some epinephrine in the bags to help us to control our, our visualization. The second thing is um, my preference is to always use a, go ahead, an insertion portal. So as you saw, what I was doing was I had my anchors going in through my accessory portal percutaneously. I would then move one of the sutures to a working portal, which was anterolateral. And then finally, I'd move them to the back, which was essentially a storage portal. So if I do that, I can make sure that I'm organizing the sutures, and I work from a back to front direction so that the sutures that I've already passed are always behind me, so they stay out of my way, and in that way I can generally achieve um, fairly good control of the sutures. And then, as you see, I'm always pulling them out independently, which means that I can be relatively assured that I'm not getting them um, tangled, no matter how many sutures are sitting in my back portal. So you're right, the suture management portion of it is a critical aspect of the procedure and probably one of the harder learning points to, uh, to achieve. <clears throat> okay, so we've got this loaded in to our second lateral row anchor. Got a little tension on it as we slide it down. We're going to bring that right into position. Can you go ahead and mallet that in for me, please? And Nick, you're using these tapes. Do you like that better than just regular sutures? I do. I think that there's a couple of advantages of the tapes. Yeah, go ahead and take that out. Number one is obviously they're stronger. Uh, number two is I think because of their, their wider, they distribute load across the tendon and improve the contact area between the tendon and the bone. And number three, because they are wider, 
some of the fixation that we get laterally is based on an interference fit, and I think that the tapes certainly help us in achieving an interference fit between the lateral row anchor and the tape to prevent slippage. So I think there's a, a number of advantages. And, and the final point is, as you see, we're doing this all in a knotless configuration. So it makes it easier for the surgeon, number one. And number two, I think that there is a benefit for the patient in terms of uh, no knots in the subacromial space. Really give those a firm tension, Rachel. No knots in the subacromial space that may cause irritation, clicking, noisiness, pain, those types of things. I think there's a psychological <laughs> component too when the patients hear or feel those knots, they think there's something wrong, even though it may be a perfect repair. So you're finishing up with this repair at this time? Yep, we're pretty good here, and we're going to move on to the tenodesis. So we're just going to cut that, and we'll show you what it looks like finally. Go ahead, Rachel. And then uh, we'll move on to the tenodesis, and if you guys have time, you can come back and, and take a look at that. Yeah. But Can, can you... Uh, once you've cut this, can you move the arm a little yep, bit just to show will. how nice and secure all this is? Good. So step on the pedal for me. So there's our repair. You can see that we've got a transosseous equivalent type repair. We have a little bit of a dog ear in the back simply based on the configuration of the tear. But you can see as we move it, we've really got very secure fixation of the tendon to the bone. And of course, we've got our chromioplasty up top. So we're pretty happy with that at this point. That looks great. We're going to go ahead and go back to Dr. Cole and see what he's doing on that instability case. Looks great, though, Nick. Thank you. Let's uh, finish up with Dr. Verma. Dr. Verma, you want to show us how to fix the biceps? Yeah, Tony. So we, we sat her back, and she started to have some hemodynamic issues. So I actually had to go ahead and do it because they want to try to get her out of the OR pretty quickly. But what we did was we made a small incision in the axilla. And you can make this fairly cosmetically in the fold. Uh, just under the uh, axilla at the inferior border of the pec. And then using my finger, uh, I simply sweep between the pec major inferior border and the short head biceps. In this situation, I take the biceps out and we used a uh, all suture anchor. So it's a 1.7 millimeter suture fix anchor. It basically creates a 1.7 millimeter hole. It's single loaded with uh, number two high strength suture. I put a crack hour stitch through the tendon, pulling up on it to try to approximate the normal tension just visually and then stitch it back into place. And you can see when we're done, we've got a very simple uh, incision here. So for this patient postoperatively, we've got the rotator cuff plus the biceps. I use a uh, Oser abduction sling. It's an orthosis that puts them at about 15 degrees to 20 degrees of abduction in neutral rotation. For this patient, uh, based on the poor tissue quality, we'll go six weeks in the sling. But with the secure repair, I'll start physical therapy with passive range of motion after the first post-op visit at about 10 to 14 days. Sling will come off at six weeks. They'll begin active assist and progression to active range of motion, but no real resisted motion other than isometrics. And then we'll finally start our strengthening phase at about 12 weeks. But we do tell patients that it probably takes about six months for 80% strength recovery, probably a full year before they get maximum strength recovery. Nick, it sounds like a very conservative protocol, but I, we certainly know a lot of people do that. Do you ever uh, increase your shorten your time to get to more active uh, activities? In other words, in a younger, more active patient, would you consider four weeks or two weeks, or do you think it's always got to be about six weeks uh, to be very careful? No, I will alter that. So I, I look at a couple factors. Number one is the size of the tear. Number two is the quality of the tissue. And number three is host-related factors, so age of the patient, um, biologic uh, issues such as rheumatoid or other things that may compromise healing. Smoking is another factor that we look at. So the, the most accelerated I'll do is a small crescenteric type tear. You get a very solid transosseous repair that we know has strength up to about 450 to 500 newtons. And those I will keep in a sling for four weeks, begin early range of motion passively at seven weeks, and out of the sling with progression to active range of motion but by four weeks. The one thing I do uh, recognize, however, is that for me at least, it's much easier to deal with a situation if a patient becomes stiff, which is still fairly uncommon despite our uh, conservative rehab protocols. If you look in the literature, the uh, risk of stiffness is about 2 to 5%, and at least in our own internal series, the risk of requiring a second surgery for stiffness is about 2%. So for me, it's much easier to deal with a stiff shoulder than it is to deal with a recurrence of a tear. So I'll hedge my bets towards going a little bit slower to facilitate tendon healing rather than being overly concerned about motion. But four weeks is about my, my quickest. And uh, just one last question. You, you did your biceps tenodesis through an incision. Do you ever 
do these all arthroscopically or is there an indication for that? I don't know that there's a difference in the indications, to be honest with you. When I do them arthroscopically, I'll do a uh, super pec location, which means below the groove but above the uh, pectoralis major, uh, using a screw fixation. I think that to, in my hands, the indication may be the younger patient who's looking for a cosmetic approach where you can do this just through a simple stab wound incision. Having said that, my experience has been that uh, you can make this a very cosmetic incision, hide it within the axilla so that even for younger females, they may not even notice that they have an incision there, number one. And number two is my feeling is that my ability to eliminate any disease portion of the tendon and to eliminate the biceps as a cause of postoperative anterior shoulder pain has led me to do a subpectoral tenodesis in the vast majority of cases. I would say I less, do less than 10 arthroscopic per year, and it's primarily if it's a patient request. Oh, that's great, Nick. Is there any questions from the audience? Questions? Any questions? How long did what take? Nick, the question was, how long did that procedure take you this morning? So we started at about um, 6.45. I would say the procedure was an hour and 15 minutes, but in fairness, about 15 to 20 minutes was waiting for you guys. So that's a typical procedure that's about 45 to 60 minutes. Yes. Do you do a bicep stenodesis on all cuff repairs or so, bicep stenotomy? So I think the biceps is very similar to the AC joint in that it's a, it's a, a preoperative di diagnosis in large part. So I pay fairly close attention in the preoperative patient to look at where their symptoms are. Are they anterior versus traditional lateral symptoms uh, that you would expect from a cuff? Do they have groove or subpectoral tenderness that may suggest a biceps problem? Is there evidence of significant fluid around the uh, biceps in the groove or below? And then obviously we confirm this with our interarticular uh, appearance. But remember that you can only see about a third of the tendon via arthroscopic visualization. So in large part, my decision to, be, to consider tenodesis is done in the preoperative setting. And I would say at this point, it's probably 50% in terms of who get some form of tenodesis or tenotomy. Now in terms of tenodesis versus tenotomy, I think we'll talk about that later today. But for me, it's based on age of the patient, activity level, pre-op discussion regarding cosmesis, and type of work or recreational activities that may be a problem for fatigue, discomfort, or cramping associated with tenotomy alone. Other questions? Nick, thank you so much. That was All right, a great guys. Thanks very much. For us. Appreciate it. See you soon.